All right, Revelation 20. We're going to continue our study tonight in Revelation. Uh, we're going to be looking at a biblical view of the end times. We're, we're getting close to the end. Uh, this is our eighth uh, lesson. Uh, of course, several of them, a couple of them were broken down into two or three parts. Uh, but this is our actual eighth title uh, tonight. And we're going to look from Revelation 20, the end of the chapter. We've already covered the first part of the chapter. Uh, and, of course, we saw the... Uh, uh, the uh tribulation period, the millennial period, and all that we've looked at. Uh, tonight we're going to look at the topic of nowhere to hide. And uh, tonight's lesson is not necessarily encouraging, kind of like when we looked at the tribulation. Uh, but this is going to be a look and a view at uh, what's going to happen to those in the end of time who die without Christ. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. And of course, this is a Sunday night crowd, so I'm looking around. All but a couple of you I feel are saved. Um, a couple of you I'm still praying for. I'm teasing y'all. But, uh, <laughs> Abby, uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but, uh, and, and so tonight we're going to look at the opposite side. You know, we've seen, we've seen how we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we've seen how uh, our, our motives and that thing, thing are weighed in the wood fire or the uh, hay, wood, and stubble and the gold, silver, and precious stones for our works and the crowns that we'll, we'll earn to cast at his feet. We've seen our, our reward as we stand before Christ. And so tonight we'll look at uh, what's facing those who die without Christ as we look at the topic of nowhere to hide. Uh, Revelation chapter 20. And if you're able to tonight, go ahead and stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's Word. Uh, again, we're just going to read the last part of the chapter here, verse 11, down through verse number 15. And the Bible says this, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. Wow, what a, what a powerful phrase. We're going to come back to that actually, okay? Uh, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up. Did I lose my microphone? Can you hear me? Okay, here we go. I thought I lost it. Sorry. Uh, verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And let's pray together this evening. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. And thank you for the time and the privilege we have to be in your house tonight with your people. And we just pray now as we've uh, sung, we've looked at a missionary letter, Lord. We've uh, just uh, lifted you up already tonight. We just pray now through the, through the teaching and the preaching of your word tonight that, again, you will be magnified and, and be uh, preeminent in our lives. And Lord, as we look at this topic, Lord, I pray that, uh, if nothing else, burden our hearts and our souls for those that we know are lost in need of a Savior, Lord. May we do our part uh, to share Christ with them, I pray. Uh, bless the time now that we have in your word for the next few moments. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. And thank you. You can be seated tonight. Many years ago, there was a young college student who came over from a foreign country, and uh, he entered the University of Michigan. That was his first mistake. Um, but uh, he entered the University of Michigan, and in his first year, his first semester, he actually flunked out of school. Uh, he was very shamed by that and knew he could not tell his family, did not want to uh, go home. So for the next four years, this young college student went into hiding. He found a, uh, an old church in Ann Arbor that had an attic that was never used. He took great pains to conceal himself and he only prowled around at night. He actually went down to the church kitchen and uh, got food that was there and water that was there to provide for himself. Never left the building. Never spoke to a soul for four years. No one knew he was there. No one suspected he was there. His family, of course, believing him still to be enrolled in school. One day, a slight mistake was made. And uh, this young boy who was in hiding uh, made just the slightest noise and somebody heard. Uh, the police were called. They came to investigate. And the young man was discovered in the attic of that church. I tell you that story and they say, well, what, what, what's the big deal? What does that have to do with anything? How, how foolish for this young man to hide for four years because he failed a, a, a college class, because he failed out of school. I mean, how, how dumb is that? You think your parents are really going like, to like kill you? He may have thought that, I don't know, but uh, how foolish to think about it, him, him hiding for four years because of his failure. And as I think about that, I can't help but think about this. 
how much more foolish is it for people to think they can hide from God? How much more foolish is it for us to think uh, uh, we can go through life, do what we want, live how we want, uh, as God does not exist, and then think we will never face God in judgment? Unfortunately, that is the belief of many people today in our world. Uh, but uh, unfortunately for them, that, that hope will never come to pass. Uh, sin will always be judged. Uh, God is righteous and God is holy, uh, and they will stand before Him one day. The verses that we read tell us about the time that the lost sinner will stand before God in judgment. At that day, there'll be nowhere to hide. Uh, there'll be no excuses. There'll be no claiming of ignorance, no false uh, profession, uh, no, well, I had good intentions. You've all heard the phrase, right? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. None of that will fly as they stand before God that day. Every person will face Jesus Christ as Lord and Judge, and they will receive a just sentence for their sins. Tonight I want to look at this event known uh, in Scripture, known by the believer, as the Great White Throne Judgment. Uh, the time where uh, the unsaved will finally stand before God, and as we know Scripture teaches, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, before we begin this, I do want us to understand not one single born-again believer will stand at the great white throne judgment. Okay, there's two separate judgments for two different groups of people. The saved have already stood before Christ at the, the judgment seat of Christ. We talked about that several weeks ago. This is a judgment just for the unsaved, the lost. Uh, so I want us to notice that tonight, and I want us to look at some facts around this judgment, and we look at this topic of nowhere to hide. And I, got, I think there's three thoughts here for you tonight we'll share. Uh, first of all, there will be no hiding from the judge on the throne. Um, by the way, it's not Judge Judy. Okay? You think she's brutal? Wait until the sinner stands before Jesus Christ. Wait until the sinner has to answer for why he rejected Christ and why he lived his life the way that he did. Uh, there'll be no hiding from the judge on the throne. Let me give you a couple thoughts about uh, this. First of all, look at, look at the, uh, uh, the picture in this throne. The picture in this th th throne. There's two adjectives used to describe this judgment as they stand before Christ, uh, the, the lost. And there's two adjectives that are used. And I want to show you those. First of, all, first of all, it's called great. The great white throne judgment. That word great refers to its, its power, its scope. Uh, this is the highest court in the entire universe. Uh, there are no appeals. When judgment is rendered from this, this throne, it is final. There's no taking it to a higher court asking for a different outcome. This is the place of highest authority and final judgment. Uh, for us in our, in our human logic to, to kind of compare this, this would be like the Supreme Court today. Okay, if you were to go to your local court and lose, you could take it to the next court, you know, the state court or whatever, and you could take it all the way up. But finally, when it gets to the Supreme Court, that's it. There's no higher court than the Supreme Court. Well, the, the, the throne here of God, as they stand before him, is the highest court in all the land. The Supreme Court doesn't hold a candle to the great white throne judgment, okay? Uh, so it's called great because, of course, he who sits on the throne is great, and the judgment is going to be great, uh, and, and there's nothing that can change what happens here at the great white throne judgment. The second adjective that is used is white. The white, as great, refers to its power. That adjective white speaks of the purity of this court, uh, all human courts are stained by sin. Every human court is stained by prejudice, uh, uh, fallibility, uh, the, the option in the room for error and mistake. This court is absolutely perfect in its judgment, and it's absolutely fair and righteous in the sentence that it will hand out. The judge who occupies the throne is infallible. There is no room of, uh, for error in his life. He is not tainted by sin or prejudice. Matter of fact, he died for all people. Okay, uh, So you see there's no prejudice in him. And he renders a judgment at this throne that is perfectly righteous and perfectly fair. I promise you this, although I will not be in attendance at this particular judgment, I promise you there will not be one sinner that stands there and says, That's not fair! Because they'll realize they're simply paying the price that they asked to pay by rejecting Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Uh, every sinner will be judged and sentenced, and they'll know they have received a fair and a perfect judgment. They may not like it, but it's fair and it's perfect because of him who sits on the throne. That's a little bit of a picture of the throne. Secondly, look at, look at the person on this throne. 
I've kind of alluded to this already. But the Bible tells us that this throne is occupied by a person. Uh, in this particular passage, uh, of course it says it stands before God, but it doesn't really necessarily uh, uh, um, identify the person who's sitting there on the throne. We know throughout other verses in Scripture and other uh, passages of Scripture, we know who sits on the throne. Uh, the one who sits on this throne is none else than Jesus Christ himself. You can see that in John chapter 5, uh, several verses there, Acts chapter 10, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, you can see it's Jesus. So the Savior becomes the sentencer on this day. Uh, when we stand before, not us, but the sinner stands before the great white throne judgment, the person on the throne that they're facing is the very one who died to save them, number one, and the very one, number two, that they rejected and did not receive. That is who now is going to pass down the sentence. As you think about that, uh, look, at a, look at a couple thoughts. Uh, look at, first of all, look at his name. Uh, the, the man on the throne, again, is Jesus Christ. Name above all names. Perfect, holy, righteous, uh, no, no margin of error, uh, no sin, uh, no bias, nothing. That's who's sitting on the throne. That's his name. But secondly, look at his nature. The, 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 the Jesus Christ that is sitting on this throne is not the, the lowly Nazarene born in, in, in a manger. It's not the poor, humble carpenter that many people refer to him as if he was growing up. The nature of the person sitting on this throne is the resurrected conqueror. It's the king of kings. It's the Lord of Lords. It's the creator of the universe. That's the nature of him sitting upon this throne. It's not some guy who was, well, had a pretty rough upbringing. This is the resurrected Lord of Lords. That's who we're, they'll, they'll stand before. His appearance is described for us in Daniel chapter 7. Uh, look at, look at uh, verse 9 and 10 here. I'm going to turn in my, in my Bible here to get there real fact. But look at, look at uh, Daniel chapter 7 and look at verse uh, 9 and 10. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire." A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. I don't know about you, as my, as my uh, human mind reads these verses, and of course other verses of Scripture as well that kind of tie in with it, I can't, I can't help but think, what a scene. What a scene to think of, of hundreds and millions of people standing before the, the throne of God as Jesus Christ is ready to pass out sentence. You think about the, the white hair and the, and the white garment and the fire that proceeds out of his mouth. By the way, the same fire that he destroyed the enemies with at the Battle of Armageddon. Amen. Uh, this, is, this is the word of God. This is God sitting there on that throne. And I just want to remind us of this, this, this simple thought, okay? As of this point, we still live in the day of grace. And what that means is people still have hope. People still have a chance to receive Him as their Savior. Uh, they still live under the grace of God. That's the day that we live in. Today is the day of forgiveness. Today is the day of repentance. As a matter of fact, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. However, when they're standing before Him at this throne, there will be no grace dispensed. He's done with grace. He's offered it. He's offered it. He's offered it. By the way, as we studied the rapture, remember how many times God judged and what did the world respond we won't, we won't repent, we'll just get angry at God. We'll continue to live the way, but we saw that during the millennium. We see this all the time, God just gives chance after chance. Aren't you glad he's a long-suffering, forgiving God? But there's a time where that mercy and that grace is going to come to an end. And when these sinners stand before Christ at the great way throne judgment, judgment, swift and sure, will be issued from the great white throne by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's uh, the person on the throne. Look lastly at the perception of this throne. The perception of this throne. The Bible tells us in verse number, verse number 11, it talks about this great white throne. Uh, him that sat on the, the face, uh, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. Think about that for just a moment. The heavens and the earth hid from the gaze of the Holy One. Hid from the gaze of the perfect judge. It needs to be remembered today again that the judge sitting upon this throne is completely 100% righteous and holy. 
Uh, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no uh, uh, pretending with him. There's no wearing a mask before him. All the masks come off. Amen. There's no sin that can be hidden from him. Uh, there's no pretending or pretense. Uh, on that great judgment day, uh, every sinful deed will be revealed. Uh, sinful thoughts will be revealed. Nothing will be hidden from the king upon the throne. You know, I know that many people live their lives today, and, and Christians included sometimes, and they think this, well, I did some things I shouldn't have done, I think I got away with it. Nobody knows. Uh, nobody knows. You know what? Wrong. God knows. God knows all about us. God knows what we've been doing when we're alone. By the way, this is scary. God knows what we're thinking. <laughs> that, that's a pretty scary thought. He knows everything there is to know about you. Uh, you, you, we can't hide anything from God. And there's going to come a day where those who feel like, well, I've hidden all my sin, I, I've looked pretty good, I went to a church, I carried a Bible, I sat in the pew, I listened to the sermons, I answered the questions, I dressed right, I, I, I fooled everybody. If they're standing at this judgment, they ain't fooling God. They're not fooling God. Uh, the perception of that throne is one of righteousness and holiness. You cannot hide from the righteous judge. He knows everything. He knows us intimately. Even like we talked about this morning, when we don't want to let him in our personal space, he already knows everything about us because he's intimate. We can't hide from him. And when this day comes, this day of final judgment, there's no hiding from the judge. Secondly, look at this thought. There'll be no hiding from the justice at this throne. There'll be no hiding from the justice at this throne. Verse number 12 and 13 talk about the books being open and who we're going to stand before this throne, the dead, uh, small and great, and all that type of thing. Look at a couple of thoughts here. First of all, uh, look at the defendants that appear on, at the throne. The defendants that appear at the throne. Now, I've never, I'm sorry, I have been to court once, and I was not the, wait, let me figure out what I was. I was not the defendant. I was the plaintiff, Okay. I was not the one getting in trouble, okay? I was the one pursuing somebody who caused trouble, all right? And uh, it was a rental home situation many, 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 many years ago. If you go to court, probably the one you don't want to be is the defendant, <laughs> right? Uh, that means you're the accused. Look tonight at the defendants that are appearing before the throne. Verse number 12 and 13 tell us this is a certain group of people that are going to stand at this great white throne judgment. We're told that those standing at the great white throne judgment, verse number 12, and I saw the dead. The dead. This tells us without, without question, if you doubted before, this tells us without question that a child of God will not stand at this judgment. Um, why is that? Well, the Bible tells us when we trust that Christ is our Savior, we've passed from death unto life, okay? Uh, and, and John chapter 5 tells us that. So we've been given eternal abundant life through the shed blood of Jesus Christ that can never be taken and can never be lost. So we're no longer dead. Does that make sense? And, and so when you think about this, the only thing that this can mean is this mass of humanity now who's standing before him at the great right throne judgment are those that are dead. Now, some of that means physically dead. Uh, it talks about the death and hell. Hell is going to cast up those that are dead in them. Spiritually dead. They've rejected Jesus Christ. So you can apply both thoughts there. Ephesians chapter 2 talks about that a little bit as well. Uh, so it's, it's, it's physically dead. It's spiritually dead. No dead is left out. I want you to see that. If you look at keep read verse 12, I saw the dead small and great. Do you realize that lost kings and leaders and politicians and great rulers of men are going to stand before God and give an account? The prince, the pauper, doesn't matter your social status, doesn't matter your wealth status, doesn't matter how popular or famous you were, lost people will stand before God. The greatest movie star who made all the millions and all the monies and everybody loved him, if he dies without Christ, will stand before Christ. Just like uh, the guy who had no home and was homeless and lived his life in sin. The prince, the pauper, everyone, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, all right? The soldier, the leader, the master, the slave, the borrower, the lender, you fill in the blank. Everyone who does not know Christ will stand before him at the great white throne judgment. There will be no escape. There will be nowhere to hide. Uh, the righteous judge will be faced on this judgment day. I, I got, I, I've got bad news for you, all right? There are going to be some deacons at the great white throne judgment. There's going to be some preachers. 
at the Great White Throne Judgment. There's going to be some uh, Sunday school teachers at the Great White Throne Judgment. Uh, no one can hide. There will be, be priests and nuns and choir members and drunks and drug addicts and, and prostitutes and pimps and drug pushers and grandmas and grandpas and teenagers and moms and dads. They'll all stand before Christ if they're lost. There'll be no escape. There'll be no exceptions. Every person who dies without Christ will face Him in judgment. You say, Pastor, you said preachers and deacons and Sunday school teachers? Yeah, you know, Matthew chapter 7 talks about that. You know, <laughs> I, I live my life and I, I, I preached for you and I did miracles for you and I... Depart from me, I never knew you. Be cursed and everlasting fire. See, because it's not about our, our service. It's not about our role in the church. It's not about our status or our position. It's not about religion at all. It's about a relationship with the King of Kings. And those that die without that, these defendants, will face Him for judgment at this great white throne judgment. All who died, regardless of where they died, will appear. You know how it talks about that? The sea cast up its dead. I, I hear people say something like this. Well, when I die, I'm going to get cremated. That way I don't have... Do you realize God had the power to create you out of dust? Do you not think he can recreate your dust? Duh. He's the creator of the universe. <laughs> he spoke it into existence. I think he can handle it. Amen? And so all from, it doesn't matter where they died, how they died, what their body looks like now, every one of them will be resurrected to stand before Christ at the great white throne judgment. Those that are in hell will be brought out for this judgment. You say, well, haven't they suffered enough? They're going to suffer more for eternity. Every lost sinner from Cain till the last, the last sinner before Christ returns to call his church home, every single one will stand before him. Every single one. I trust that nobody tonight will be in that number. Amen? And I trust if you're watching us online tonight, uh, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, boy, I sure do plead with you. Get to know Christ. That's the only solution for this problem. That's the only way to get out of this judgment is by knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. The defendants appearing at the throne. I want you to look at this next. Look at, uh, let me get this to switch. Here we go. Look at the documents used at the throne. The Bible tells us here that the books will be opened. What, are, what does it mean when it says books? It's plural. What does plural mean? Okay, more, more, than, more than one, right? Several, okay? Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of king theology here tonight, okay? And I try to do this when I say things like this, okay? I'm going to give you some things that I think. Whether I'm right or wrong, I won't know till we get to heaven. Whether it matters or not, I don't know. It's not going to keep you in heaven or, or keep you out of heaven. But I want to give you some things that I think about this, okay? Um, only one of these books used is called the, 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 the Book of Life, um, but I, there's some other books I believe that are going to be open during this day because it says books. And so I want to give you my, my, my little bit of king theology tonight, okay? And again, you can take this with a grain of salt. You can take it like it's gospel. It's not because it's my, my thinking, okay? And you might have a different opinion and you might know, say, hey, what about this? And that's fine and that's good and that's well. I'll be happy to discuss it with you. And say, hey, I never thought of that. That's great. But I want to give you what I think, okay? Number one, I think the Bible will be one of those books opened. You say, well, why do you say that? Well, John chapter 12, verse number 48, Jesus himself reminds us that we will be judged out of his word. Okay? Uh, so I think the Bible will be open. Uh, the Bible that, by the way, these sinners that are now standing before him, that's the book they openly mocked. That's the book they refused to listen to and heed. That's the book they said, that's just an old antiquated book. Oh, just some men wrote that. It's not important. That's the very book that they mocked. I believe it'll be open that day, and they'll see, hey, I rejected that book, and now it's a book that's going to bring me judgment. Number two, and again, I, I, uh, maybe my titles are different than what you might think, but I, I put down number two, I think there'll be the book of deeds. And again, you could, you could title this any way you want, but I think in heaven, uh, there is being recorded uh, and kept a record of the deeds of men. I believe when men stand before Christ at this great white throne judgment, their deeds will be revealed. Now, whether a movie screen plays, you know, and shows you all your sin, or a document is read, or it's just held up and said, look, here we go, we got a record. I, I don't know how it will happen. Uh, but I believe their deeds, both good and, and evil, will be recorded and, and may be mentioned as they stand before Christ. I don't know all the details. But I believe they'll be brought out and open that day. You say, why do you even think that? Well, look at verse number 12. 
At the end of that verse, what does it say? It says they will be judged, uh, the, books, uh, the things written in the book, according to their what? Works. So you can call it the book of works if you want to. It doesn't matter. But I believe a book will be open that says, look, you can't fool God. We got a record. You can't fool God. We got a record. Uh, we know what you did. Uh, he- and here it is. Uh, now, he- here's my thought about that. People have a choice today. They can choose to stand on their own record and face God, or they can choose to come to Jesus and let him expunge their record. It's their choice. It's their choice. Faith in Christ, you know what it does? It wipes the record clean. Uh, When I stand before God, you know what he does not look at? My sin. Because instead of seeing my sin, what does he see? He sees the imputed righteousness of Christ on my life because my faith has been placed in Jesus Christ. You see the difference? I don't know about you. I'd much rather stand on the expunged record of Jesus Christ. And when God sees me, he says, what sin are you talking about? Than to stand and say, well, I, I, think, I, I think my good outweighed my bad. I think I'll take my chances. Well, I'd much rather go on God's side. Amen. <laughs> so you see, maybe the, the book of deeds. Uh, man's record is clear. Uh, it's, it's sinful. But boy, when we get saved, the, the, the book is open. You know, what, you, know what Christ, you know what God sees? The precious blood of Jesus Christ. That says, hey, because of Calvary and an empty tomb, this man's sins are gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Amen. That's the difference. We've got a choice. I think number three, I'm going to give you four here. I think number three, we'll see the book of life. The book of life. Uh, Revelation chapter three, verse number five. I'm going to give you some more king theology here, okay? Uh, I'm going to try to explain this here. Revelation three, verse number five. If you know anybody who believes... You can lose their salvation. This is a verse they will use. Uh, Revelation 3, 5 says this. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And so many people say, well, if your name can be blotted out of the book of life, then you can lose your salvation, right? Let me, let me give you my logic and my thought on this, okay? I believe the book of life, and again, you take this for what it's worth, Um, I'm of the opinion there's a book of life or a book of the living. Because there's also the Lamb's book of life, which we'll get to here in just a second, okay? Uh, The book of life is a book of living people. Every name of every person who was ever born would be recorded in that book. However, when you die without Christ, what happens? You're no longer living. Your name is blotted out, all right? If you die with Christ, you are still alive in Christ. The name stays. You got it so far? You understand what I'm saying? You understand where I'm coming from? So we can't lose our salvation and have our name blotted out. But if we die without Christ, our name could be removed from this book of life, if you will. The only hope for salvation is for your, is for your name to be in that book of life. Because once it's removed, your life is over. The chance for salvation is gone. So I think the book of life will come into play. In any sinner who dies without Christ, their name is removed. Uh, If you die with Christ uh, or you're living, uh, you're still in that book of life or that book of the living, if you will. The fourth one then is is, is the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. And again, there could be 12 more. I don't know. We don't have all the details. Like I say, some of this is my conjecture from my study and from what I personally feel. You disagree with me, that's fine. I will not punch you in the nose, okay? It's all good. Uh, The Lamb's Book of Life. Revelation 21, next chapter over, verse number 27 says this. And there shall in no wise enter into it, that's heaven, anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The Lamb's Book of Life. I think there's a distinction there. Uh, A a word is used here that's not necessarily used with the Book of Life. Uh, This book contains the names of every single person who's been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. It does not contain the names of every person who joined a church. It does not contain the names of every person who got baptized. It does not contain the names of everybody who was religious. It contains the names of everybody who was redeemed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary. Made him that choice to trust him as their Savior. Those names are recorded for us in the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, By the way, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus tells his disciples to rejoice over that fact. 
of their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. The book records those who know Christ as their Savior. When the great white throne judgment comes about, here's what you'll find out. If my thinking is correct, the book of life and the Lamb's Book of Life will match up perfectly. Okay? So if your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life, it'll also be in the Book of Life. That makes sense? And again, uh, whether I'm right or wrong, we'll, we'll find out when we get to heaven. I'm, I'm probably wrong because I'm wrong a lot, but uh, we'll, we'll see how that all comes to play. Uh, but again, it's a little bit of my own thinking and study and, and theology there. But uh, th- when that happens, everything will come into order. And only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life will, 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 will enter into heaven. Everyone else will be standing at this great white throne judgment. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine standing before God in that terrible day, lost, as the record of your, of your life is, is exposed, uh, being forced to finally admit, I am a sinner, I needed a Savior, and I failed to accept, but I rejected that Savior that sits on the throne. He's opening up the Lamb's Book of Life. And if what all those Christians told me is true, my name is not in it. Can you imagine the horror? Can you imagine the despair Boy, once again, uh, let's make sure we know Christ. Uh, let's make sure He's our Savior tonight. Uh, uh, boy, uh, just, just again, make sure the relationship that you have with Christ is what it is. And you know Christ as your personal Savior. What a terrible day that will be for the sinner as they stand before God. That's a little bit about the documents used at the throne. Uh, look, at, uh, look at the decision made at the throne. The decision made at the throne. The last phrase in verse number 13 tells us all. And they were judged... Every man according to their works. When these books are open, judgment will be rendered on the evidence found in the books. Now here's the thing about evidence. Uh, what does is, what is a courtroom require today? Evidence. The more evidence, the more convicting the case, Right? The evidence that will be found because it's recorded in heaven is going to be 100% accurate and it's going to be 100% complete. It's worthy of noting this. Every person will stand before God on their own. We got a lot of buck passing going on in our world today. Well, I behave this way because my parents treated me. Your parents are not going to stand before Jesus with you. Well, I act this way because I felt oppressed in society. Society is not going to stand before Jesus with you. Well, I acted out and I didn't trust Christ and I lived the life I want to because you fill in the blank. You will stay. By the way, Satan who gets us into all the trouble is not going to stand there with us either. We will stand and answer at this judgment, the great way throne judgment, by ourself. By ourselves alone. Regardless of the excuse we might use to justify our lifestyle, They'll answer to Christ and receive final judgment. Uh, It won't matter who stood in your way or who put you down or who did whatever in your life. It'll be you and Jesus Christ. Period. Uh, Boy, I tell you, it's it's better to know right now where you have hope of salvation to come to Christ than to say, well, I'll wait until it'll be too late. It'll be too late. There's no hope. There's only judgment. That's the decision from the throne. And as we said before... It's final decision. The judgment is rendered and nothing can change it. But I, but I, but I, but I, depart from me. I never knew you. But you don't under... The king of the world, the king of the... He he does understand and he does know. And he's going to be 100% accurate, fair, and just, and righteous in his judgment. The decisions made will be proper at this throne. You cannot hide from that. You cannot hide from the judge on the throne... You cannot hide from the justice at the throne. The third thing we'll see is this. There'll be no hiding from the judgment from that throne. There'll be no escaping it. There'll be no second chances. There'll be no reform time. There'll be no like, hey, just give me a chance and I promise I'll come out better. There'll be none of that. There'll be no hiding from the judgment that will be doled out. First of all, I look at this judgment and I see a fearful judgment. I see a fearful judgment. What is the sentence that is the judgment? Death. Death. It's not just physical death that we think about today on earth. This is is the second death, the Bible says. This is a spiritual death. This is separation from God 
for eternity in the fires of a place called the lake of fire. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 uh, talks about that a little bit as well. This will be a death where there is no dying. Uh, what I mean is there will be no end to the torment, to the pain, uh, to the, all the things that are taking place, to the hell that is being endured, to the awful nature waiting this sinner. It will be an eternal state of dying apart from the presence of God or anything good. It will literally be what we refer to as hell. That's what they'll be enduring. Can you imagine the horror of this? Can you imagine? I put Matthew 7 up there. Can you imagine the, the, the horror of hearing that phrase, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. By the way, I, I often say this, and I'll say it right now. This is a little sidebar here, okay? I believe every word of God is there for a reason. I believe every word of God is accurate. I believe it's every word of God is important. Do you notice what he says there? It was prepared... Not for us. It's prepared for the devil and his angels. So these, these scoffers, that, you mean that loving God would send people to a place called hell and all that? He doesn't send us there. We choose to reject him, thus sealing our own fate. To go to a place that wasn't prepared for us in the first place. But that's the fearful judgment as it's handed out. Death, depart from me. Uh, I, I live life the way I wanted to, but boy, the end is sure not the result I was hoping for. Without regard for God while I lived and now separated from God who I wish I could be with. Uh, there could be nothing so terrible. Uh, perhaps the only thing worse than that is a religious person who hears the same words. And has that. But I depart from me. He cursed. Uh, we need to come to Christ while there is time. And while His grace is still being extended... Come while there's still hope. Because when we stand before the great white throne judgment, there is no hope to escape this fearful judgment. The second thing you see is this, uh, letter B. It's a final judgment. Remember in Luke chapter 16, the rich man and Lazarus died? Remember the story? And Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom. And, and uh, the rich man went to hell, right? And what did it say? In hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. And he asked for Lazarus to come. And remember, just, just give me a, a drop of water. We'll talk about this morning. You can put your tongue on my mouth. if it's got on my, uh, Finger on my tongue if it's got a drop of water on it. That's all I'm asking for. And he said, nope. I can't do it. Uh, he's there, you're there. There's a great gulf fix between. Can't do it. Can't do it. It's permanent. It's final. Uh, it's final. The uh, Bible says in Psalm 9, 17, uh, that the wicked shall be cast into hell. Uh, there is no second chance. There is no, well, I'll, I'll turn my life around. You had plenty of chance to do that. It's final judgment. Final judgment. The last day a sinner will see uh, is that day as he stands at the great white throne judgment. And here's those words, depart from me. It'll be the end of the road, forever consigned to the lake of fire for eternity, eternal torment. Now, I know many people don't believe that's true, and many people don't believe in the reality of hell. If you study the Bible, you'll find out hell is mentioned more than heaven. And if you believe the Bible, you believe all the Bible, you believe hell is real. And I know there are people that will deny it today. Well, if you deny hell, you deny the Bible, period. Okay, you can't, can't argue with that. It's a final judgment. No, no appeals. No, no reform school. No boarding school. No, hey, fix, you punish me, and then we'll get it right. No, none of that. It's the final judgment. The last thing I put down tonight I'll share with you is this. It's a foolish judgment. And I don't mean that God is foolish for exacting this judgment. What I mean is this. It's a foolish judgment because it's rendered but doesn't have to happen. It's rendered but it doesn't have to be. We do not have to receive this judgment. You see, any sinner who's willing to repent and turn their life to Jesus Christ alone in his faith, uh, puts his faith in what Jesus Christ did for him on Calvary, can be saved from this judgment. To go through this judgment and reject the bloodshed of Jesus Christ on Calvary, who is the only sufficient thing to bring salvation, that's foolish. And so to be, have this judgment enacted upon their lives means that was foolish. That was foolish. The blood of Christ is sufficient the grace of God is sufficient. Uh, the Bible says where sin abound, grace does much more abound. We cannot sin the grace of God. 
I wish I had a nickel for every time I talk to somebody. He says, well, I'm such a bad sinner. I don't think God could save me. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. It's sufficient. The blood is sufficient. The grace is sufficient. His love is sufficient. All that will come to him by faith shall in no wise be cast out. Don't do a foolish thing, friend, and die without Christ. Come to him while the door's still open. Come to him while the day of grace is still there. Well, I think that this could possibly be mo- one of the most horrible scenes recorded for us in all of the Bible. The concept of people perishing forever is terrible beyond description. I don't rejoice in it. I don't look forward to this judgment. I, I feel for anybody who says, I'm willing to, I'm willing to, I don't care, I'm willing to endure, I'm going to go down in hell and drink beers with my friends. Oh, my friend, what a foolish decision. And the judgment you face is foolish because it doesn't have to happen. If you have not been saved, come to Christ. If you don't know Him as your Savior, uh, accept Him today, receive Him today. If you do know Him as your Savior, can I just say this? This this lesson tonight is enough to say to me, I want to be diligent and do my due part in telling people about Christ. I don't want anybody to have to face that. I don't want anybody to have to endure that. Be diligent about serving Christ and telling people about Christ. I want to close just real quick with an illustration. I heard uh, years ago there was a a ship supervisor in a shipyard. His name was Arnold Lewis. And uh, his work as a ship supervisor took him from ship to ship all day long. As it was being constructed and being uh, built, he was there making sure everything was done properly. And he'd travel from ship to ship. One day an inspector had showed up and needed to meet with him about some business there. And he hopped from ship to ship trying to find Arnold. And uh, he couldn't find him and he got frustrated and got impatient. Finally he got the right ship and he found Arnold Lewis. And this inspector uh, looks at the supervisor and he says, You know what, Arnold? Man, I've been looking all over hell for you. And Arnold looked at that man and said, You know what? That's one place you'll never find me. I've never been there. And I never will be because I've been saved by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing more was said on the subject. The men got about their business and covered the policies and the things that they needed to take care of. They went their separate ways. At the end of the work day, just before the whistle blew, the inspector began looking for Arnold once again. He found the ship Arnold was on and he came to Arnold and he said this, You know what? I've been thinking all day about what you said to me this morning. And I wish, too, that I could know I'm saved from hell. Arnold said, of course you can know that. And he just happened to reach into his pocket and just happened to have a New Testament. And he went through God's simple plan of salvation and shared with him what the Bible said. And right there on the deck of that unfinished ship, with, I'm sure, other prying eyes watching, this inspector bowed his head and trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. You know, honestly, that can be anybody's testimony tonight. Because it's not about a church. And it's not about our works. And it's not about a baptismal pool. It's not about being good. It's not about tithing. It's about a relationship with Christ. Well, I sure hope that every one of us tonight could say, if somebody were to say that to us, that's one place I'll never be. That's one place you'll never find me. And if you're a child of God tonight, that's your testimony. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you cannot say that. And I would encourage you once again, if you don't know Christ, He's worth knowing. And He'll take you just as you are. He'll apply the blood of Christ to your life. He'll clean you up and He'll change you into what you need to be if you'll just let Him. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful I'll never stand before the great white throne judgment because I know Christ. But I also want to remind myself to be diligent and sharing the gospel with the lost who are going to face this if they don't come to Christ. Let's make sure we do our part. Next week, uh, we're, we're, again, we're winding down our series here. Next week, we're going to look at a glimpse of a place called hell. And as we wind this down, we're going to look at hell uh, and see how it's described in Scripture and uh, see the definitions and those types of things. Uh, and then I'll be uh, gone for a week, and then we'll come back the first week of June, and we'll close the series out with a glimpse into a place called heaven. We'll end on a good note, amen?
it was rocky sometimes between in this series, wasn't it? And the rapture and the, the, the tribulation, all those things, the bad, you know, that. We're going to end on a real good note, a glimpse of heaven, all right? And so next week, come back uh, and be back with us, and we'll look at this glimpse of a place called hell, and hopefully it'll be, again, a challenge to us, uh, because I ain't going there, amen? <laughs> but I sure do know there's a whole lot of people on their way there. And I want to do my part to share Christ with them. Let's pray together tonight. We'll be dismissed. Father, uh, we love you tonight. We thank you for the Bible. Lord, we're thankful that uh, uh, your grace and your love and your mercy and your blood is sufficient for anyone that will come to you. Lord, there's no limit. There's no standing in line. There's no cap on how many people can come to you. And we're so thankful that salvation is simple. Uh, Lord, it's something that uh, even a child can understand. And we're so grateful for the truth and the power and the wonder of salvation tonight. And Lord, we're so thankful that if we're saved, we'll not stand before this terrible judgment. But Lord, I pray that you'll challenge us as saved people to share the gospel of Christ with others so they will not have to stand there either. And Lord, I pray if there's somebody who's watching our, our, our video tonight or in our service even tonight that does not know you, Lord, I pray that they'll reach out to somebody here at the church, call the office, reach out to me, my wife, or somebody in the church and say, hey, I'd like to know how to have that relationship with Christ. And Lord, we'll take the Bible and show them how they could know that for sure. Uh, Lord, I ask you now as we uh, leave tonight, we just ask for safety as we travel. And we ask you to bring us back again on Wednesday as we meet together. We pray and uh, we praise and we open your word and we study the word of God. We just pray that you'll bless our Wednesday night service. Help us to live for you, Lord. Help us to, even in the workplace and at school. Uh, may we represent you. May we tell people about you this week, I pray. We thank you for all you do. We thank you for your love and your goodness. And of course, the special, precious blood of Jesus Christ by which we're saved. We're so grateful for that tonight. Uh, dismiss us now safely, we pray. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Goodbye. God bless you. Shake a hand or two on your way out, and we'll see you on Wednesday.